Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Kibam Kwan. I'm an assistant professor in the University of Kansas uh, Mechanical Engineering Department. First, I would like to thank the committee uh, for a uh, kind invitation and giving me an opportunity to present our uh, work on the field of separation processes. So today I would like to introduce our recent work in the field of the barrier separation technologies for water remediation. So as you may know that the water remediation is a big uh, challenge in many different applications. And what we are uh, focusing on is how to remove the dissolved contaminants or the suspected contaminants from water. So we have been working on developing a new materials or the technologies that can effectively remove these contaminants from water. And uh, today I'd like to briefly introduce those uh, recent um, works in, uh, in our lab. So uh, let me briefly introduce myself. Uh, I am an assistant professor in the University of Kansas from 2016 uh, in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, however, my uh, background is the material science. And what we are interested in is the materials of the uh, soft materials such as tubitanic polymers or hydrogels or um, the responsive materials such as photocatalytic materials. And also we are interested in uh, modulating the surface flexibility of these materials. So you may have, uh, you may already know that the hydrophilicity or superhydrophilicity or oleophobicity, which is oil repellent uh, rotabilities. So our interest is how we can modulate the surface flexibility of these materials and uh, their unique functions for the separation processes. So we are typically, uh, we are uh, particularly interested in the membranes for oil water separations or uh, wastewater treatment or even uh, desalinations recently. So in this talk, what we uh, what I want to introduce is the about four projects that we have recently uh, accomplished. So one is how to remove the deserved contaminants. So we just uh, we are interested in uh, so-called PFAS, uh, perfluoroalkyl substances. Uh, it's all fluorinated materials. And then it is an emerging contaminant uh, in the United States and or, uh, worldwide. So we recently published an article uh, on, uh, of the uh, thermal response material that can so-called catch and release the PFAS based on the temperature fluctuation. Uh, first, I want to introduce our work in this, this field. And what we have also were in, interesting is how to remove this PFAS using so-called electro absorption process. So you can see here, uh, cathode and anode, we apply the voltage and then this PFAS in water, which is anionic PFAS is attracted by the positive charge where the proton is attracted to the negative charge. So using this one, uh, we are also able to show the reversible PFS absorption and desorption upon applying the electric voltage field. And uh, unlike this dissolved contaminants, the more conventional uh, separation uh, water remediation field is to remove the suspended contaminants. We are particularly interested in the separating oil from water. And as you know that the filter or the membranes for oil water separation, uh, the biggest problem is the fouling. So whatever the oil or organic substances does deserve, uh, absorb to the filter surface and that results in the decline in the flux. 
So our interest is how to make an anti-fouling or fouling resistant membrane at the same time, uh, more active or dynamic fouling remediation. So we are uh, interested in this photocatalytic material. So open light illumination, this catalytic material coated on the surface can degrade or decompose the fouling. The problem was this photocatalytic process is not selective. So which means that it can kill both uh, oil foundants at the same time, some desired or desirable um, coating materials. So in this work, we have developed a strategy how to decouple the photocatalysis and uh, uh, the coating materials. And then uh, finally, let me uh, introduce uh, the one of the work that we have developed a visible light responsive photocatalytic filter for oil water separation. So let me first start with uh, our first work, uh, lower critical solution temperature driven catch and release of PFAS from water. So this LCST, uh, lower critical solution temperature, is one of the features of uh, thermal responsive polymer. And let me explain that in details. So before we move on, let me briefly introduce the PFAS, uh, poly and polyfluoroalkyl substances. It is an uh, organic fluorine with a very good chemical and thermal stability. So uh, typically this PFAS is grouped into two different uh, categories. One is the long chain, short chain. PFOS or PFOA, octanoic is relatively long. Butanoic or pentanoic or even shorter is relatively short. So this PFAS has been utilized a lot of in different uh, applications ever since 1940s. One of the uh, extensively used application is uh, in the firefighting foam because it's good exceptional thermal stability. Pesticide or non-sticking cooking wear, uh, food packaging such as Teflon, so PFAS has been utilized extensively in this uh, real uh, practice. Recent report a study re uh, reveals that this PFAS is actually accumulating in the human body and it can cause several health issues in the human body. And then again, this is because of its very good uh, stability. It does not get decomposed naturally. That is what uh, one recent uh, report has revealed. So uh, this is an emerging, um, this has been an emerging uh, contaminant found in the water or soil. So because it is a uh, very good, uh, it is uh, durable and then uh, long lasting, it does not get easily decomposed under natural process. It can, once it is uh, discharged into the environment, such as soil or water, then it is just circulating uh, the entire environment. And then uh, this map shows uh, where the US continent is contaminated or actually PFAS is found in the drinking water system or the, uh, the soil. So interestingly, this military site, uh, these purple dots, are uh, all, uh, many places are contaminated by the PFAS. And then this is primarily because of the, its uh, training of the firefighting. And more severe problem is also found in this Michigan or Eastern uh, East Coast uh, in drinking water system. And then uh, this raises a big uh, health concerns. So uh, ever since this, problems has been raised, US EPA and local state government has established its own uh, regulations on the allowable PFAS concentration in drinking water system or soil. Still it is under 
debating and it is under investigation. But in many state governments has established the, uh, the maximum allowed uh, concentration of this PFAS in the order of PPT, parts per trillion, which is one millionth of the PPM. So it is extremely small and trace amount uh, uh, PFAS. So actually this such a small amount can effect, uh, affect the human health. That also raises the another question, uh, which is how can we detect such a small amount of PFAS from water? So in addition to removing PFAS, can we even detect such a trace amount of PFAS from water? So that is driving us to, uh, to think about, okay, uh, let us think about how to uh, detect PFAS or sense the PFAS. Our idea is then, all right, let us first observe and then accumulate and retain and at certain uh, concentration, then let us release for the characterization. Uh, current PFAS technologies are uh, mostly focusing on removing PFAS from water. One of the uh, popular and effective ways is activated carbon uh, for the absorption. So it is based on the hydrophobic hydrophobic interaction and through its uh, high porosity and surface area, and mostly this activated carbon uh, uh, absorbent is inexpensive. However, it is less selective and then relatively slow kinetics. Another effective way is the filtration. Uh, it's a little bit expensive, but it is very effective. But because it is relying on the size exclusion, so the very small pore allows only water molecule to pass through, but blocking this uh, uh, long chain PFAS, uh, it is able to separate them out. But the problem is energy consumption because the pore size is very small. It should, uh, it needs the external pressure to be applied to force water to pass through, but blocking PFAS. The problem, another problem is fouling, which is universal problem with the membrane over uh, filter-based operations. Uh, more uh, recent approach is electrochemical absorption, uh, which features the, it is regenerable and better selectivity and then relatively faster kinetics. But uh, it is a little bit expensive and it is affected by the pH level because it is electrochemical process. The simplest but effective way is just destroying the PFAS. So for example, incineration is one of the most powerful and effective way to remove this PFAS from our uh, environment. But as you see that contamination, energy intensive, so on. Our approach is, as I said, okay, so current PFS related the technologies are focusing on removing, but actually it is better for us to develop a, a, a detect or characterize the PFS, uh, which is in, typically present in a very small amount. So our approach is uh, developing a polymeric absorbent we utilize this NIMAM, poly, uh, PNIMAM, polyisopropyl metacrylamide absorbent, uh, which is very similar to NIPAM, um, but uh, it's a little different uh, structure. So we uh, use the MBAA as a crosslink and then crosslink in the, uh, the form, and then it shows the polymerized NIMAM. As I mentioned, this our NIMAM, uh, based absorbent to demonstrate the LCSD behavior, uh, lower critical solution temperature, which means at lower temperature uh, below the LCSD, then it exhibits extended coil-like structure. 
but high temperature, it is collapsed structure. And this collapsed and extended structure is reversible based on the temperature switching. And we characterize the, um, the, the LCST of our NIMMA based on uh, the DSC measurement. And then we found that it is around 71 to 74 Celsius degree uh, based on, uh, depending on the cross-linker density. So if we use the more cross-linker, then it's uh, LCST is higher, less cross-linker than a lower LCST. Okay. And then this LCST behavior allows us to show the reversible absorption and desorption. As I said, the cross-linker density affects the uh, LCST value. Also, we found that the uh, cross-linker density, uh, cross-linker concentration affects the surface area. So here, what I'm showing you is the based on the cross-linker concentration, the surface area of our NIMA absorbent. So as you expect, a uh, higher cross-linker density, then it shows the higher uh, surface area. And higher surface area shows the higher um, uh, uh, absorption capacity compared to the lower uh, cross-linker density. And, um, and we also measure the maximum absorption capacity, alpha max, uh, based on the, uh, the surface area. And we found that the higher the surface area, then the more PPS is, can be observed to the substrate, uh, I'm sorry, uh, absorbent. And we think about the mechanism of reversible absorption and desorption of PFAS based on the temperature. In case of absorption, when the temperature is higher than the LCST, let's say the temperature is 80 degree, then hydrophobic hydrophobic interaction, and then this PFAS and the uh, minimum uh, interact and then absorb. When the temperature becomes lower, then water molecules occupy the, the site and then release this PFAS into, uh, into the environment. So based on the temperature, high temperature, low temperature, absorption and desorption can be reversed. Uh, and that results in the uh, catch and release of the PFAS. So in this work, we tested uh, different PFAS, uh, absorption and desorption. So uh, these are the long chain representative. These are the short chain representative. So here, PFOA or PFOS is octanoic. PFHX or PE, it shows that hexanoic or pentanoic. And we studied whether our NIMAM is more effective or less effective for long chain or short chain. And this is the absorption kinetics. And uh, as a function of time, the absorption capacity is measured. So how much of the PFAS is absorbed to the, our NIMAM absorbent uh, as a function of time. So this red solid diamond shows the long chain PFOA. And then this gray circle, hollow circle is the short chain pentane. And it clearly shows that the absorption for long chain PFS is much higher compared to the short chain. And this uh, difference is because of the, the hydrophobic hydrophobic interaction. So the longer the PFS chain, then the, it's a hydrophobic interaction with the NIPAM, I'm sorry, the NIMAM is becoming stronger. And then we found that this absorption kinetics is following this uh, second order kinetic uh, equation. And then we just uh, plot, made a plot with uh, this TR uh, inverse as a function of time. And then the slope is uh, kind of a K2. And then using this obtained K2 values, we just uh, plug in and then see whether it fits well or not. And then uh, regardless if the chain length, 
long chain or short chain, if it's good, which means that it follows the uh, pseudo second arithmetic model. And then finally, we uh, developed a prototype device that uh, enables reversible absorption and absorption and desorption of PFS from water based on the temperature. So it is about 30 degree tilted uh, with respect to the horizontal plane. And then the support is coated with our NIPEM, about 100 micron uh, film. And then we uh, feed water with PFS, and then it flows through and high temperature. Then this PFS is absorbed to the minimum. And then what we eventually collect is PFS free water here. And then after uh, this process is over, then we lower the temperature, uh, let's say room temperature, and then we just flow the DI water. And then while this DI water, pure water flows through on the surface, then this PFAS is released and then it uh, comes with the water and then we can collect this PFAS contaminated water. So as I mentioned, our focus is catch and release mechanism. And this is important for, uh, for one to, uh, to accumulate and retain the PFAS and on demand to release the PFAS into certain solvent to, uh, to make it concentrated uh, sufficient for the PFAS detection uh, instruments such as HBLC. So this is the real photo of our material. So this is a syringe and then it is connected to a syringe pump. We uh, push the PFS contaminated water at a constant rate. And this is tilted about 30 degree. As this PFS contaminated water flows through our NIMAM at high temperature, the PFS is observed and then we can collect this water at the bottom. Uh, if we want to release this PFAS from the NIMAM to regenerate or concentrate, then we just flow the DI water at lower temperature and then collect the PFAS uh, containing water. So this is the proof of concept experiment. We use the short-term PFHX solution in water. The initial concentration is 0.6 mg per ml. Uh, and then we fed about this rate at uh, 75 Celsius, which is slightly above the LCSD value. And then we found that the decontaminated water contains about 0.23 uh, mg per ml uh, PFHX. So which is the concentration uh, becomes almost 60% uh, 60, 60 down compared to the original case. And then we also uh, demonstrate that this absorption and desorption is reversible without showing significant variation. So uh, this is the uh, initial uh, absorption and desorption, absorption and desorption. And we are able to show up to five uh, cycles of the uh, reversible catch and release case. Uh, in summary, we have developed a, a thermal responsible absorbent using NIMAM uh, with LCSD that allows us to reversibly absorb and dissolve the uh, PFS from water. And this is important in uh, not only removing PFS, but also sampling the PFS uh, from water upon temperature switch. Um, the dissolved contaminant PFAS can be uh, removed and sampled, accumulated not only by the, this uh, thermal responsive hydrogel, but also it can be done by this electrosorption uh, process. So in the second part of my uh, presentation, let me just introduce the, uh, another project which is recently published in RSC Advances. Uh, it is uh, reversible absorption and desorption PFS on uh, inexpensive graphite electrodes uh, via alternating the voltage. So as I mentioned, the electrosorption of PFS is also interesting uh, approach. Basically, it is quite straightforward and intuitive. 
uh, proton and anionic PFS are attracted by the oppositely charged the electrode upon the uh, voltages um, applied. And then this electrosorption or electric field AD, the absorption and desorption of the contaminants from water is not a uh, very uh, new approach technology. It has been already uh, shown by uh, various researchers for the PFS electrosorption because of its uh, various features. For example, uh, electrosorption of PFS has been featured as uh, it is more. Um, less selective to its based on its chain length so long chain and short chain both of them are uh, fairly uh, well adhered to the uh, electrode surface time and then it is also um, re regenerate it can be regenerated or it is reusable because as you see that uh, when you apply this bias then it observed the pfs and proton, if you reverse the bias, then it can be released because of the uh, version. Also, uh, it, it can show the absorption capacity, uh, increase the absorption capacity based on the uh, modulating the applied voltage or modulating the electrode surface area. And then finally, it can be uh, made as a compact uh, portable device. Uh, in this work, we also show the very uh, small compact device that can be applied to the portable uh, water purification device. Uh, I will show you uh, the later slide. So based on uh, this design principles, we have developed the uh, uh, absorbent or the electrode in this case using the inexpensive graphite. It is a very simple process. We use the graphite uh, dis dispersion, and then we use a small binder, mixing those two solution suspensions into four to one ratio, and then we just uh, use the hydraulic press, and then make a one inch by one inch, or uh, the substrate, uh, the electrode on a substrate. And then the SM image of our uh, graphite electrode shows that, uh, interconnected and overlapped uh, planar structures. And then these uh, stacked and planar uh, structures uh, is very helpful to provide a large surface area uh, to transport and diffusion of the PFS. And we measure the BT surface area of our electrode and it shows the type four isosome. And then uh, it shows the pore size in the range of about um, two to three nanometer to all the way down to 18 nanometer or even a little bit higher. So it, it is called the mesoporosity. And then the majority of the pores are believed to be in the range of a few nanometer to 100 nanometers. So which is a, a perfect uh, observant. Uh, for this uh, PFS removal. And then using our graphite electrode, we first uh, characterize it uh, using the cyclic uh, voltammetry uh, for long chain and then short chain. So as you see that the capacitance for the short chain is greater than the long chain case. And then you see that it is uh, absorption and desorption as a, uh, absorption and desorption cycles are reversible and it is fairly reproducible. Um, and then this is just, uh, this is showing that our uh, graphite absorbent uh, can serve as a very good electrode for this electrosorption of the PFS from water. And we, uh, we engineered the prototype device that allows us to do uh, show the absorption and desorption of PFS via just the reversing the voltage. So this is the PDMS plug, and then the separation of the uh, these two electrodes, cathode and anode, is separated by the 
spacer. And then we uh, using this uh, syringe, we just uh, continuously flow the PFAS contaminated water through this electrode. Then we collect the uh, decontaminated water at the outlet. And we applied about 1.2 voltage between the anode and cathode, and then we utilized the PFOA and PFPA as a long chain and short chain. And then uh, the results shows that as a function of the voltage, uh, higher the voltage, then absorption capacity is increasing. But the trend for short chain and long chain is quite interesting. Uh, it shows that the short chain PFPA shows the much higher absorption capacity compared to the long chain. And then uh, it is also recyclable. It is, although it, it is showing a little bit of the decrease in the absorption and desorption uh, efficiency uh, after about four or five cycles, but it is, uh, it is basically uh, reversible. And then, um, as I said, the short chain PFAS, uh, and we have tested the short chain and then long chain the PFAS, and then collect all these absorption uh, capacity values. And then this plot uh, shows that the short chain shows, uh, for example, PF HXA um, six and heptane seven, nona nine, and then decan 10 short chain shows the higher absorption capacity compared to the long chain PFS. And then we also compare the width and without voltage to gauge the electrosorption is actually better than the just absorption. And then we clearly shows that the width and without voltage it is about 40 to 50 times higher absorption of the PFS as opposed to the uh, just, uh, just absorption based one. And we also studied the absorption or desorption kinetics of this uh, using our electrode. And then we found that the pseudo second order kinetic model can fit very well, match very well with the experimental data, uh, regardless of the long chain or short chain. Okay. And then uh, desorption and absorption, both of them follows the second order kinetics. We can extract the rate constant for absorption, which is K1, and then desorption at K2 uh, with these values. And then using this K2 and K1 values, we uh, utilize this uh, again, the kinetic model, and then back at play, and it shows that it matches fairly well. And finally, we um, engineer the small device that allows us to uh, remove this PFAS from water and then collect the decontaminated or purified water on the gravity. This is the stacking of the anode cathode with a spacer. And when the PFAS contaminated water is applied on top of this one, this porous structure, okay, so anode and cathode, which are porous structure of graphite, spacer is made by the nylon mesh. So porous structure allows all this pure water goes through while uh, applying the voltage traps the or observe the PFS and then collect the pure water. So we tested the PFPA short chain PFS using our uh, device. And then we use three different initial concentration, 30 ppm, 20 and 10 ppm and then uh, show the absorption. And then it shows all this down to uh, 30 ppm goes down to 5.5. 10 ppm goes down to 0.1 ppm. Uh, and just the uh, one single uh, permeation. And then we also tested the desorption test. And then this using this uh, cont uh, still contaminated water and then uh, desorption test and then it goes uh, fairly go back to its original uh, case, which shows that our uh, device model can be reused after regeneration. And then we also studied the spatial length uh, effect on the absorption rate, because if the spatial length is too, th is this spacer is too thick, 
then the permeation is slow and then the absorption rate is affected. Then we found that if the spatial uh, thickness is too thick, then absorption rate is too, uh, too small, which is expected. So in summary, we developed a, a device module and an electroabsorption technology to reversibly absorb and dissolve PFAS using the uh, using the electric field. And then once we re uh, reverse the electric field, then absorption dissolution process is uh, recycled. Okay, then uh, let me talk uh, briefly about our uh, other two projects uh, for the separation of suspended contaminants such as oil. So as, you, as I described in the earlier slide, uh, we are interested in making a, a self-cleaning or photocatalytic filter. The problem is that this photocatalysis is not selective. So you can kill not only the undesired uh, filament, but also you can uh, degrade or decompose the desired desirable uh, coating materials. So our idea is to decouple this photocatalysis and uh, the wettability. So this work is also published in this year. Uh, and then uh, we try to make a, a photocatalytic membrane with the decoupled photocatalysis and then wettability. So as I mentioned, one of the critical challenges in the membrane filtration is the uh, the permeation of the undesired contaminants and also the, the membrane fouling. And then to overcome this limitation, the membrane or filter was coated with a photocatalytic uh, material such as titanium dioxide here. And then on the UV light, TiO2 can generate this uh, highly reactive uh, the, the radicals. And then those radicals can uh, reduce or oxidize oxidize the organic substances. But, um, but because the, the TiO2 has a relatively large band gap energy, so it can only, can be only activated by the UV light, but nitrogen doping allows it to absorb visible light and then do the same uh, performance. So uh, as I said, the problem is that uh, such a photocatalytic membrane is effective in uh, cleaning the membrane surface after foul, but uh, the problem is they, uh, it can kill the desired coating materials. So our approach is how to decouple this photocatalysis and wettability. So we, uh, we mix the two materials, which is nitrogen doped TiO2, so visible light responsive, the photocatalytic material. And you will see that you see that here, the, the developed NTiO2, nitrogen of TiO2, observed the uh, broad range of the visible light up until here. And then also we prepared the silicon, uh, silica, silicon dioxide nanomaterials, which is uh, grafted by the perfluorocyanate. And it will reduce the overall surface energy so that it allows the, the overall coating to be oleophobic. Okay, so oil repellent and then also water repellent. So our hope is that at certain ratio between the NTiO2 and FSiO2, it will show the hydrophilic and oleophobic uh, wettability with the uh, photocatalytic uh, activities. So we apply the mixture of this TiO2 and SiO2 mixture to the uh, reverse osmosis membrane with the uh, uh, optical uh, curable the adhesive uh, coating. So first the RO membrane is coated with the adhesive and then followed by the spraying of NTiO2 and SiO2 and then cross link. And then this is the uh, RO membrane surface area. And then based on the TiO2 composition uh, with the F SiO2 composition, then we can show that water contact angle is low, but oil contact angle is still high. And then hydrophilic and oleophobic wettability is very desirable for effective oil water separation. 
And because of this order publicity and hydrophilicity in air, uh, our filter coated with the NTL to FSIO2 shows the very low uh, oil adhesion force uh, submerged in water, which is very uh, important for its underwater oil publicity. And then we show that the water rich flux is still declining because of the, uh, the, the fouling. So uh, in order to achieve this uh, in situ photocatalytic degradation of the surface observed fouling, at the same time to demonstrate the flux recovery under uh, visible light, we just uh, fabricate or customize the cross flow cell here. The membrane filter can be mounted here. The backlight, the visible light can be uh, shined at the backside. And then the, the fees go in and the cross flow and then come back. And then while it flows through, then the water is permeate goes up here and the raffinate is collected at the bottom, and then like uh, recycled. So this is the, just a regular uh, flux decline, uh, which is not very tip, uh, uh, not very different from the previous studies. But the interesting part is as soon as we uh, shine the light here, then flux is going a little bit up and then flux is going, uh, going up a little bit. And then this is just because of the photocatalytic degradation of the oil fallons uh, observed to the uh, surface. Interesting part is that uh, after this photocatalysis driven flux recovery about one hour, uh, we, after one hour of the continuous visible light irradiation and photocatalysis, we measure the oil contact angle after that. And then this plot clearly show that the contact angle does not change, indicating that the wettability is not getting affected. So this is very unusual. Uh, because the typically after photocatalysis, it can degrade all the organic composites, even the uh, the floral uh, perfluoro silent, and not only the perfluoro silent, but also I we have shown that the salt rejection effect uh, effect is uh, salt rejection is not affected by the after the photocatalysis, and the coating NTIO to SiO two is not delaminated. And then the coating is all the chemistry is uh, it remaining the, uh, unaffected. So this by doing this, we are able to fabricate an outer membrane um, coating uh, that can demonstrate the decoupled wettability and the photocatalysis. In the last part of this talk, I want to briefly introduce our uh, work on the uh, metallic mesh and filter that can show the visible light self-contamination, uh, decontamination, and oil water separation. So it is published in 2020, and then we utilize the, uh, now instead of the nitrogen doped TiO2, we uh, dope the TiO2 with the iron. And then iron is also, iron doped TiO2 also shows the uh, visible light uh, absorption. And then we spray coat this F FTIO2 onto the stainless steel mesh. And then you can see that the surface is all rough because of this nut factor. We further um, anneal the, this uh, coated mesh at a high temperature, about 1,000 uh, Celsius. And then what we found is this nanoparticles is uh, is forming a certain uh, certain bridge to the bottom stainless steel mesh because of the um, because of the annealing, heat annealing, and then this bridge is playing a critical role in uh, adhesion of this nanoparticle to the substrate. And then using the same apparatus, we uh, conducted the continuous oil water separation and in situ photocatalytic degradation or decontamination. And uh, uh, as you see here, that the surface, even if it is pre wet by the water, then as soon as we apply the, uh, we introduce the oil in water immersion, then the flux declines. And this is because of the fouling. And here, 
it's found. But as soon as we shine the visible light, then the flux starts to increase, which indicating which indicates that the uh, the surface gets uh, cleaned because of the photocatalytic degradation of the oil uh, volume. And not only the surface clean, the filter cleaning, but also what we have found is uh, certain dissolved or suspended uh, materials, contaminants in the water, while it passes through our uh, mesh under shining light, then this guy is uh, degraded uh, because of the photocatalysis. And then we also studied uh, the, the flux, uh, the decontamination process using the first order kinetic model. So in summary, we have shown, uh, we have developed a metallic filter with a ion of TiO2 that can demonstrate in situ uh, photocatalytic degradation of the surface of observed uh, organics and um, the set, uh, continuous separation of oil and water mixtures. Um, this is what all that I have prepared for this uh, presentation. And I'd like to uh, thank my uh, the final support from the NSF and uh, NASA and Bureau of Reclamation and the University of Kansas Research Office. And uh, if you have any questions, then I will be happy to answer any questions.